one of the reasons we've gathered together like this for four years is because we really are anxious to know what our Creator is like. I'm sure some of us here are not too sure whether there is a Creator or not. And if that's the situation, then do try to come to something like the seminar on the rationality of Christianity at 9.30 that meets here every Sunday morning. And do try to read some of the books by Pinnock and uh, Paul Little uh, on Know Why You Believe. But the majority of us have examined the record of Jesus' life in Galilee and are convinced that it's true and that it's reliable history. And we've become convinced that he really lived and did and said the things that they say he did and said. And we believe that he is really God's son. And because of him, and because of the other revelations of God throughout history, because of the order and design of the universe itself, there are many of us here, if not maybe the majority, who do believe there's a God, and we're concerned not with whether there's a God or not, but what this God is like, so that we can respond to him in a way that pleases him, and that it is, a way, is consistent with reality. And so that's why, really, we've been meeting together for four years. The title of the study this morning sets forth a principle upon which God himself operates. It seems to me it's a principle upon which many of us do not operate. And it's because we don't operate on that principle and see the importance of that principle that many of us end up in the situation that is described in that verse in Romans 7 and 22 that we're studying today. Maybe you'd look at it, Romans 7 and 22, and it's page 982. It's 982. Romans 7 and 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. I think a lot of us end up in that position because we don't live by this other principle. And we don't really understand that God operates by it. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. And most of us would probably say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you tell me something good to do, yeah, if there's something inside me that says, yeah, I just want to do it. I want to do it. And so we have no trouble with that. It's the whole problem of getting that out that we have trouble with. And really the reason we have trouble with it, loved ones, is we don't really see that this Eden in wilderness principle is a basic one that God works on and he works on no other. Now maybe you would just look at it as it's uh, instanced in the creation there, if the record of his creation. If you look at it in Genesis 1 and verse 2, you can see how it progressed. Genesis 1 and verse 2. <coughs> if you have real troubles with the uh, scientific interpretation of Genesis, then you ought to look at some of Henry Morris's books. You remember he's a professor of hydraulics in one of the southern universities and has written a number of books on creation and evolution. And uh, Henry Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. But Genesis 1 and 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So that was it, without form and void. Then God begins the beginnings of this old principle. Brings a little bit of order, increasing order. Verse 3, cosmic light. First of all, introduces cosmic light. Doesn't necessitate the sun, it's cosmic light. Then verse 6, makes a distinction between space and the planet. That's really what that means. It's the distinction between space and the planet in verse 6. Then goes on, makes a distinction between sea and land on the planet in verse 9. A little more order. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. Then he begins to bring more order into each of those areas. Vegetation for the land in verse 11. Plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit. 
then begins to fill up the space. Verse 14, light reflectors. That's what the Hebrew means. Let there be light bearers, bearers of the cosmic light in the firmament of the heavens. Then begins to fill up the sea in verse 20. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. Then creatures for the land in verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. So, you know, real chaos. Just a kind of crude piece of matter at the beginning and then more and more order. And that's part of the principle. Not entirely the principle. But that's part of it. God brings more and more order, increasing order in his universe. You see, there was one limitation in what he had created so far. I mean, the sheer symmetry of the sunrise or the sunset certainly sets forth part of the Creator's glory. The sheer beauty of Adelia certainly sets forth some of the graciousness and the delicacy of God's conception. But you do see that it was limited insofar as it could set forth God's glory for one big reason. Could a tree be anything but a tree? No. Could a river ever flow up a mountain? No. Could they ever be other than what they were made to be? No. That was the limitation of these inanimate objects as far as setting forth God's glory is concerned. Because the special glory of God is that he's a free person. That's his special glory. He doesn't have to flow up a mountain if he doesn't want to. He can flow down it. He doesn't have to be a tree if he doesn't want to. He doesn't have to be a god if he doesn't want to. He is what he is because he wants to. He doesn't have to love us. He doesn't have to make us. He just wants to. And the glory of God is that he's a free personality with a free will. And that's what makes it so great that he's chosen to do what he's done. Now, do you see that all the things that he made up to that point could not reflect that freedom of will? They all 